Iconography is a profound art form. There's a tremendous amount of theology and spiritual reflection that goes on behind the creation of an icon. You have to be aware of its theology, uh, what it's trying to say. You have to also be aware of the cultural context in which the icon is going to be used. Here in Jordan, we have a largely Islamic society, an Arab culture, and a small Christian community within that. We have a Latin church here at the shrine of Our Lady of Angera. Um, iconography really belongs more to the Eastern churches, such as the Greek Orthodox. So there's a lot of things to bring together in these particular icons. In order to do that, the process that I followed was first of all to go back to the Bible, to read, to reflect, to pray, to mull things over in terms of the theology of uh, the rosary and the mysteries that were going to be depicted. Then I began to map things out, just rough sketches. Um, I made a cartoon of the board and onto this I began to sketch ideas. This is um, a sketch for the Sorrowful Mysteries. You can see Jesus on the cross in the centre, Jesus carrying his cross down here and so forth. Eventually, uh, the final version that I chose was a combination of this and this sheet here. I decided to try and make it quite simple so that the figure of Jesus really stood out. And we had that idea of Jesus really walking alone to the cross. You can see scattered, sketched into the margins are all sorts of notes. Um, these are little aid memoirs to me as I was thinking through um, how to put things together. However, besides the um, particular theology of each particular icon, um, first of all, it needed a construction. Here you can see the geometrical design which lies behind the glorious mysteries. This draws very much from Arab society and Islamic society where sacred geometry has played a very prominent part. The origins of Islamic geometric art lie with Byzantine Christian art. When the first Arab civilizations began to be established in this area, and mosques and palaces began to be decorated, it was Christian artists who largely did the work at the beginning. And they used sacred geometry because they couldn't use the figurative tradition of the church. So by being able to go back into that sort of sacred geometry, it's a way of connecting the icons that are being written here in Angera with the wider Arab culture. And that is really important because iconography is a work of incarnation of actually taking the reality of God and speaking it in a particular place at a particular time. And for that we need to be sensitive and aware of the culture around us. Iconography is an ancient form of painting. It goes back 1,500 years. And the medium that we use is not oil or watercolour or acrylic, but egg tempera. This is this is Not bad. Not bad. A bit light. Huh? Washing off the, just washing off the, the white of the egg. Okay. Do we have a fork? A fork or a knife? You can see that the egg is now clean. Okay, and you can see it's in its sack. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is just make a hole and dribble it. Maybe that's a bit much. But. You see how that's. 
avec toi, mais je crois qu'il y en avait sept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. So, here, so like that. Using again just the um, yellow with white. I'm just going to bring up that nose. There we are. You see how that's begun to come forward. Again, here on the cheeks, let's just uh, intensify that light. And what we're trying to do is not to get um, a sense of reflected light, a natural form of art. What we're doing here is trying to give a sense of luminosity, that the person is filled with life, which comes from God, which, as it were, emanates through. That is very important with the saints, Christ, and people like that, because they're really showing, we're really showing the work of the Holy Spirit alive in the person, um, rather than a natural setting that we're looking at. So these subtle um, layers of colour help give a sense of that sort of luminosity of the flesh, as though it's sort of almost glowing. Um, very important in the eyes. So here. Also, well, almost as though the light is flowing out of that eye. The eye, the window of the soul. I'm going to put a little bit of red now uh, to strengthen the mouth. So, it's a quite dark red, not a vibrant red. Um, and then around the edge of the nose, it's going to line. Besides pigments, we use gold. Not gold paint, but real solid gold. It comes in a form of sheets, very, very fine, very, very thin sheets of gold, which, you'll pop, which come in these little booklets. So we take the gold and we have to stick it to the icon board. For that, We have to first um, coat the surface with this stuff, bowl. It's um, red clay, very, very fine, um, and then it's mixed with um, animal hide glue, which is then applied hot to the surface that's going to be gilded. That then is sanded very, very, very finely, um, just as you would if you were polishing um, a car that you are going to um, repaint um, after a repair. It'll be very, very fine, so it's got a mirror surface. Then, you have to be able to manipulate the gold. Because it's so uh, fine, um, you've got to be able to handle it very, very carefully, and that's quite an art. You have a cushion like this, which you place the leaf on, and what happens is that the, the water sucks the gold off the tip onto the surface. You've got to get it as smooth as possible without any water um, getting onto the surface because that will discolour the gold. Um, And then you've got to leave it to dry and then using a very soft brush, you gently tickle it. Tickle the gold until it's smooth and flat. And you can continue using that brush to burnish it to a bright surface. In his apostolic letter on the rosary, John Paul II explains that the importance of the recitation of the rosary is not simply as an act of personal contemplation that takes us into the very heart of the Christian mystery, but also as a way of praying for peace. He writes, The grave challenges confronting the world at the start of this new millennium lead us to think that only an intervention from on high, capable of guiding the hearts of those living in situations of conflict and those governing the destinies of nations, can give reason to hope for a brighter future. 
The rosary is, by its nature, a prayer for peace, since it consists in the contemplation of Christ, the Prince of Peace, the one who is our peace. Anger is situated in the north of the Kingdom of Jordan, close to the borders with Syria and Israel. It's situated, therefore, in the heart of an area decimated by conflict and warfare. It is to this situation that the icons in Andrea seek to speak. The first icon panel is the Joyful Mysteries. Here we celebrate the Incarnation, the coming of God among us into the flesh, into the material world full of grace and truth. The temple was the place where the Jews believed that God lived among them. And it was this presence that went right back to the time when they left Egypt, led by Moses into the desert. At that time, God commanded Moses to erect a tent of meeting. And in that tent, God would manifest himself as glory, as a golden cloud, which the Jews referred to as the Shekinah. So the first theme that we find in the panel is that God dwells among us, that he has tabernacled among us. Just as God dwelt in the temple, so now he dwells in the person of Christ, who has come among us full of grace and truth. The second theme is that the word has become flesh. In other words, that he is revealed, that he has taken on a human face. This revelation comes first in the words of Gabriel to Mary, then in the visit of Mary to Elizabeth, where the presence of the conceived Christ is recognised within her womb. In the presentation of the newly born infant to the priest in the temple, who recognise that here the Messiah has come. And then finally in the words spoken by the adolescent Christ in the temple to the teachers of the law. This not only fulfils the words spoken in the Old Testament, and throughout the panel we have the words of the prophet Isaiah inscribed. But it also points us to the next panel, when Christ will not only teach, but also manifest the power and the glory of God in the mysteries of light. The third theme is that having been manifested in the flesh, he is someone to whom the humble and poor in spirit can not just see, but to whom they can respond. Notice that the teachers of the law sit below Christ, who now takes the seat of Moses, while the Magi, who have travelled far and had to humbly ask those same teachers for the wisdom that they lack to find the newborn Saviour, join a local shepherd on the hillside. The ancient priest Simeon bows his head, while Elizabeth and Mary are attending to their daily chores. Notice the rug hanging on the wall, waiting to be beaten, just as it would be in the region today, while Mary, at the Annunciation, stands beside a large water pitcher and holds spinning yarn in her hand. And there, in the centre, is Joseph. He is asleep, and the angel comes to him in his dream to help him and to strengthen him. For Joseph is a man who is struggling to defend the Holy Family in the midst of hatred and hostility, while wrestling with his own doubts to comprehend the truth in all the amazing events he has been caught up in. In this he is much like the many Arab Christians who are challenged by their Muslim neighbours to explain how they can possibly believe such an impossible thing that the uncreated God could become a helpless baby, and who at times face violence at the hands of those who want to eradicate this truth about Christ. And finally, Christ brings joy to the world. Notice that in this panel, it's filled with vibrant warm colours, the colour of the earth, of the buildings and the furniture. It's bright, light and radiant. The wolf and the lamb are depicted curled up close to where the Christ child is born, at peace in a moonlit landscape while Simeon the priest smiles gently as he receives the Christ child into his arms. And Elizabeth and Mary break into a dance of joy, a dance that echoes a hymn of Easter, which is sung 
in the eastern churches. The angel cried to her, who is full of grace, O pure virgin, rejoice, and again I say rejoice, for your son has risen from the grave on the third day. Shine, shine, O new Jerusalem, for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Dance now and be glad, O Zion, and do you exult, O pure Theotokos, in the arising of him whom you did bear. The mysteries of light focus on Jesus' ministry, not in terms of events done, but what that really reveals about God's relationship with his world, a relationship that is focused in the person of Jesus. St. John, at the beginning of his Gospel, writes, Through him, that is Jesus, all things came to be. Not one thing had its being but through him. All that came to be had life in him, and that life was the light of men, a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness could not overpower. This life and light of Christ is something that infuses the created world, transfiguring it, and especially in the human person, offering the possibility of theosis, or divinization, or sanctification being made holy, sharing in the life of God. We see this divine light shining in the ministry of Jesus, and in this icon panel, which is diffused with brightness and light, we can see how Jesus' is coming among us changed people. We see Jesus challenging the disciples at his baptism, so that they would become indeed fishers of men. We see Jesus turning water into wine. We see him washing his disciples' feet and beginning the Eucharist and the life of the church with a very different mentality to that which had previously been associated with leadership in a religion. And Jesus healing people. In this panel we see him healing the man born blind. These are just excerpts of the many ways in which Jesus touched the lives of ordinary human beings and opened up for them the possibility of life with God in eternity. The incident in the Gospels which most clearly shows this process is the Transfiguration. The figure of Jesus dominates the composition. The figure is larger than all the others, and those bright white garments silhouette the figure against the golden background. And yet the golden background itself helps to enhance the figure with its brilliance and light. This is further enhanced by the use of the Arabic patterning, twelve stars surround him, which speaks of the fullness of Israel, which bears testimony in the Old Testament to the person of Christ. We can see how the perspective of the Transfiguration challenges us, both to recognise Jesus who he is, to share in the testimony and to listen to the words of the Old Testament prophets, but in the end to find ourselves among the disciples who in various ways react to this revelation of Christ in his glory. Here Jesus is strengthening them and therefore strengthening us in preparation for the experience of the next panel which is the sorrowful mysteries, the passion of Christ, the sufferings which we share with Christ in our life of discipleship. Written deep into this panel is the idea of how people respond to Jesus and this symbolised above all by the reaction of the Apostles, who are to bear witness to Jesus. In Islamic law, you need two witnesses to make a true statement. And so, for example, here we have the two Apostles witnessing Jesus' baptism, two Apostles witnessing the miracle at Cana in Galilee, three Apostles witnessing Jesus' transfiguration, and then, of course, all the Apostles present at the Last Supper. Above all, we see Mary clearly gesturing to her son and to the servant and saying, listen to him. This, above all, is the way in which the world is changed by the gospel being heard and being lived, entering into the hearts of humanity and as putting on the mind of Christ. Life in the gospels is often associated with water. Water in baptism, water in the feast of Cana in Galilee, water which washed the disciples' feet, and water which was used to wash the 
blind man's eyes and which restored his sight. So here we see a unity of light and life symbolized by water. The perspective of the scene also helps to make a powerful statement about where we fit in with this experience of transfiguration. At one level we're standing before Christ, looking straight at him. But at another level we find ourselves below him at the level of the apostles. At one point we're looking down onto this mountain as it rises up and proclaims Christ. And in the centre of the panel, at the bottom, close to the servant's feet, we can see a well or a font. And this represents the place where we can share in the divine life through our baptism and the sacramental life of the church. The third panel, The Sorrowful Mysteries. This panel is much simpler than the others. We are confronted with the cross, and on the cross, the body of Christ, as it pours itself out in love for the Word. Christ spreads his arms in submission to the will of the Father, while his body is poured out, his precious blood streaming down into the parched earth, and from there into the very depths of hell. On the left of the panel, we see Jesus' movement voluntarily in fulfillment of the Father's will to ascend the cross, while on the right-hand side, we see those who through their hatred, their cowardice, and their violence would send Christ into the tomb. On the left, Jesus walks essentially alone, yet he finds their comfort and solace from those who love him. We have the angel in Gethsemane, the stranger who helps him carry his cross, the Blessed Mother who he meets along the way and at the foot of the cross, together with the beloved disciple and St. Mary Magdalene, she who loved much. On the right of the panel, we see Jesus with those who would send him to the cross, with their hatred, their violence and their cowardice. And yet, among them are those who, touched by Jesus' witness to God's love, Longinus and the good thief, are moved to conversion and to faith. While on the left-hand side, those who do offer Jesus some support and comfort are those who must pay the price of grief. Mary, John and Mary are enveloped in grief as they shelter beneath the cross and see the Son of God suffer and die. The sorrow on the face of Jesus and Mary as they meet along the way is the sorrow of one who knows that in doing the will of his Father he must wound his mother's heart. How heavy is the cross that he carries, knowing that he must wound those who love him most. Jesus, to fulfill the will of his Father, hands himself over voluntarily into the power of earthly authority, Rome and the Jewish authorities. Both turn on him with viciousness and cruelty. In this composition, we see Pilate raised up on his dais, while the Jewish authorities stand outside and below, their hands raised up as they cry out, We have no king but Caesar. Having handed over their authority to Pilate, Pilate himself washes his hands and doesn't know what to do with Jesus, puzzled by the enigma of a man with such humility that he cannot crush him. And so Jesus is handed over into the hands of violent men, as chaos reigns, where there should be law and order. Jesus stands in the vortex of all this violence and chaos, absorbing into himself everything that is thrown against him. And yet, he does not respond in kind. Rather, true to his nature, which is love, he pours out compassion upon Adam and Eve, upon all of humanity and its need for redemption. As he stands at the pillar, he gazes down upon the skeletons of the still dead Adam and Eve, whom soon, through the shedding of his blood, he will bring life and peace and resurrection. Here, in the destruction of death, we see the triumph of love, humility triumphing over pride. Where there should be the ugliness of death and decay, we see here the Prince of Peace reigning from the cross. 
The focus is not upon the physical sufferings of Christ and the disfigurement of his body, but rather illuminating the inner man who triumphs despite the evil that he experiences. Here we see the triumph of love over death, the triumph of humility over man's arrogance. And so the kingdom of God is established. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. The fourth and final panel, The Glorious Mysteries. The Glorious Mysteries present to us the reality of Christ's resurrection and how that has transfigured our world. It's the paradigm by which we can understand the deeper significance of what has taken place in the previous mysteries. But it also establishes the horizon of eternity when Christ will return and will be all in all. There will be a new Jerusalem and Christ will be the son of righteousness and all of us raised to the dignity of the children of God. Here we see a very different portrayal of Jesus. He's no longer the one who is rejected and spurned. He's no longer a humble, small and helpless babe, but rather he is the Lord of glory. In the ascension, just as in the resurrection, he wears golden garments and around him is the mandala, proclaiming his divinity, proclaiming that he is the one in whom God is revealed in his fullness. Notice that the mandala of the Holy Spirit matches the size of the mandala of Christ at the Ascension. This is because they are equal members of the Holy Trinity. And just as Christ is ascending on the one side, so the Holy Spirit is descending on the other. Notice that the mandala of the Holy Spirit emerges from the mandala of Christ's resurrection. For it is indeed by the power of the Spirit that the Lord is raised, but it is also through his raising that the Holy Spirit is sent. Notice that instead of the chaos and disharmony, especially of the sorrowful mysteries, here the apostles are gathered in an orderly way, anointed by the Holy Spirit and giving unified testament, especially notice in the scrolls of the evangelists, to the truths of what they have seen and heard. These are reliable witnesses speaking in harmony about the divinity of Christ, true God and true man, the Saviour of all. This apostolic witness is focused on Mary Magdalene, the very centre of the composition, there by the tomb, just as she was in the historical accounts. But here she is bearing witness for all time to the truths of what she has seen and heard, that she bore to the apostles and now bears to us. As the Apostle John says at the end of his Gospel, there were many other signs that Jesus worked and the disciples saw but they are not recorded in this book. These are recorded so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing this you may have life through his name. We see the Virgin Mary at the heart of the celebration of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, just as she had been overshadowed by the Holy Spirit at the Annunciation. Now, she stands confidently upright, her arms open in prayer, glorifying her Son, and echoing the role that she will play in the life of Christians before the return of Christ as the intercessor before her Son. But this is itself only a foretaste of the role of Mary as Queen of Heaven, which will be consummated when Christ returns, she the bride unwedded, greeted by the bridegroom, and she holding up her son as the light which will fill the new Jerusalem. Here Mary is depicted as Queen of Heaven, dressed as a Bethlehem bride. So in this fifth and final of the glorious mysteries, we find ourselves transported back to the very beginning, to the first of the joyful mysteries, when Mary became the Mother of God by virtue of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. She who was secretly glorified is now glorified in the very heart of the cosmos. Her son, the radiant Lamb of God, who shines over the new Jerusalem.